moment, Pauline knew that he had never seen him before. Pauline started to point up the street when he noticed Fletcher Zeno coming toward him. Fletcher was the only black cab driver in St. Adrian, and he was lucky to get more than three fares on any weekday. If he got more than a half dozen on weekends, counting Saturday and Sunday, he, was, he, could, he considered this more than lucky. Pauline knew this, and he thought he would let Fletcher get the 75 cents or the dollar that he charged to take someone back to town. Taxi here, taxi here, Fletcher said. Fletcher was a small jet black man with quick motions. Not only did he walk fast or turn fast, but he talked fast. He laughed quickly. He stopped abruptly. Back of town, he said, up the river, down the river, the island, this way, this way. He grabbed at the blue laundry bag that Robert had slung over his shoulder, but Robert did not release it. Instead, he asked Fletcher how far was back of town. Too far to walk on a day like this, Fletcher said. You agree there, Pauline? Pauline nodded his head. You'll get wet before you get halfway back there, he said. <clears throat> I don't mind getting wet, Robert said. How far is it? Caution, no more than 75 cents, Pauline said. How far is it? Robert asked again. Mile, maybe a little bit more, Pauline said. Mile and a quarter, I reckon. Which way, Robert asked. Pauline looked at Fletcher, who was standing a little to the side of Robert, shaking his head again. Fletcher shook his head with the same quick motion that he did everything else. Robert saw what was going on between them and went inside the station. The bus station was a small office, and four or five people could fill it easily. John Ledoux, the big Cajun from Point Capi who ran the garage and the bus station, was sitting behind his desk talking to the woman who had just come in there. Neither one paid any attention to Robert, but after a while, the woman did glance back over her shoulder at him, but said nothing. Ledoux went on talking as if no one else had come in. Ledoux sold your tickets through a window. If the weather was bad, he would let some white people he knew come inside and stand by the heater. Since it was his office and not a waiting room, he did not have to let blacks in there, and he never did. The blacks could go into the garage where Pauline worked and stand by the heater in there if they wish. After Robert had been in the office about ten minutes, the woman looked back at him again and asked him if he wanted to see Mr. Ledoux about anything. Robert told her he only wanted to know where he could find a place to stay. Now the woman turned and started pointing up the street. She told him to walk about three blocks and then turn left. After going a quarter of a mile, he would see a hardware store, then he would see a lumber yard, but he had to cross the railroad tracks. After crossing the tracks, he would see a big gray house on the left that advertised rooms. Robert thanked her and went out. I wonder why they didn't tell him that out there, she said to Ledoux. It seemed the simplest thing in the world, but she never finished because Ledoux had just hollered for Pauline to get in there. It was so loud, so abrupt, the woman jumped back from the desk, patting at her breast, from the desk, patting at her breast. Pauline came into the office with his cap in his hand. Ledoux had started talking to the woman again, and he went on talking to her another couple of minutes before looking at Pauline. I want that car ready tonight, he said. <clears throat> but Mr. Ledoux, you said I could finish it tomorrow, Pauline said. I told you I had that little business I had to tend to tonight. That was before I was interrupted, Ledoux said. Now I want that car ready before you go home tonight. Pauline turned slowly and went back out. He was not angry with Ledoux. He was not even angry with Robert. He was looking for Fletcher because it was Fletcher who had brought this trouble on for him. But Fletcher, as usual, had quickly disappeared. That's chapter one, chapter two now. Virginia Cola was standing in the kitchen looking out of the window when she heard the knocking at the front door. She could see how the wind was blowing the limbs in the pecan tree and she thought the knocking was no more than a limb brushing against the side of the house. She turned from the window to check the pot of soup that she had cooking on the stove. After tasting it to see if it was seasoned well enough, she nodded with satisfaction and lowered the flames in the pot. She heard the knocking again, this time louder than before. She was sure there was someone out there now, and she went to the front to let him in. When she opened the door, she saw Robert standing in front of her, soaking wet. Water ran from his cap down his face, leaving, his, leaving little crystal drops hanging from the scraggly beard on his chin. They told me you have rooms, he said. I got some. But she stopped. She didn't like, like him from the beginning. He was too thin, too hungry looking. She didn't like the little knots of hair on his face that, she, that he called a beard. She knew he was sick. His jaws were too sunken in for a young man. His eyes looked at you but didn't see you. He could have just been released from Angola Penitentiary. He definitely looked like someone who had been locked in. 
they probably had let him go because they figured they had punished him enough already and they knew he would die soon. Something in the back of her mind told her to tell him that she had made a mistake about having room. She had just rented the last one to, a, to an insurance man this morning. But she asked herself, where else could he go? Uptown to one of those rooms of that white motel, would they let him in there? By law, they were supposed to, but couldn't they say they didn't have any vacancy either? She stepped to the side to let him come in. Then she looked outside again. She was looking for Fletcher's cab, but she knew it would not be there because if Fletcher, because Robert's clothes and the laundry bag wouldn't have been so wet if Fletcher had brought him to the house. That's a dollar a day, she said, still holding the door open. She wished he would say a dollar was too much for a room, then she would have a good excuse to send him back out there. I want it for a week, he said. That'll be seven dollars, she said, and I appreciate my money in advance. She waited until he had reached into his pocket before she shut the door and told him to follow her to her office. Her office was a small desk and a chair that she had sitting in one corner of the living room. At the door, she told him to stay out there in the hall while she went into the room to get the key and the receipt book. Where are you from? She called from inside the room. He didn't answer her. She came back out. I asked where you was from. She demanded this time. <laughs> Chicago, he told her. She looked at him, and at the laundry bag, he still had slung over his shoulder. She didn't believe he was from Chicago. The money, she said. He gave her a wrinkled five dollar bill and some change. The change money was black with corrosion, as if it had not been used in a long time. Your name, Virginia said. Robert, he said. Last name, she said. X, he said. She was holding the receipt book against the wall while she wrote down this information. When he told her to put X, she drew down one line and stopped. She wasn't looking at him yet. She was still looking at the receipt book, trying to recall what group called themselves X. She could not remember whether it was the Black Panthers or the Black Muslims. Something in the back of her mind told her to give him back his money, but something else asked, where else would he go? Uptown? The whites would not let him in there either. They had turned out fatter ones and drier ones than he, and she was sure no X had ever slept in any one of those beds. She looked at him now. I don't want no trouble in here, she said. I run a nice, orderly place. I don't bother the law. The law don't bother me. You hear me, don't you? He didn't answer her. He wasn't even looking at her. He was looking at the receipt book she held against the wall. She had drawn down half of his last name, and he might have been looking at that. Virginia couldn't tell from his gaze where his mind was. She slashed down the other line across the first and told him to follow her upstairs. You must have walked from the station, she said. He didn't answer her this time either, and after climbing another step, she stopped and looked back at him. He was standing two steps below her, with beads of water still in his beard, and that, laundry, that blue laundry bag slung over his shoulder as if he were leaving instead of coming in. I'm accustomed to people answering me, Virginia said. Besides, that is show breeding. I walked, he said. Wasn't Fletcher there, a little ugly black man with red beady? He was, he said. He was, she said. She wanted to say, and he didn't stick a gun in your back, or, and he didn't drag you to, his car, to that cab. But she didn't say it because he wasn't looking at her. He was looking past her as though she were not even there, as if she were not even there. Something in the back of her mind told her again to give him back his $7. But something else said, where else would he go? She led him up to his room and lit the little gas heater. Then she went to the bathroom down the hall to get a bucket of water to set on top of the heater. The water would keep moisture in the room. All the time that she was in the room with him, he stood at the window looking out at the rain. He had not taken the laundry bag from his shoulder or taken off the cap or unbuttoned the coat. The toilet and the shower down the hall, the foyer of the hall, she said. I change sheets and pillowcases once a week, Saturday. They are already clean, so I won't be changing them tomorrow. When you get hungry, the best place around here is Thelma's Cafe. It's about three blocks farther back of town. Her husband, Wrigley, runs the nightclub next to it, a place called the Congo Room. He didn't seem interested in what she was saying, and she, and she went back downstairs to the kitchen. She dished up a bowl of soup and sat down at the table to eat, but she had eaten only no more than a couple of spoonsful when she thought about Fletcher, and she went up the hall to her office to telephone him. Fletcher's cab stand was at Thelma's Cafe, and Fletcher must have been sitting at the counter or standing nearby because... As soon as Thelma answered the telephone, Virginia heard her say, it's for you, Fletcher. Fletcher, he said, you rich or something? 
Virginia asked him. I see, Fletcher said. He found his way. So you all did talk, Virginia said. And you didn't stick a gun in his back to make him get in that cab? I had Polly in bag for me, Fletcher said. That don't work neither. Virginia heard him drink something quickly. It could have been a cocktail or a cup of hot coffee. He did everything quickly. You got your money? Fletcher asked. He wasn't exactly throwing it away around that bus station. I got a week in advance, Virginia said. Cold rain do that, Fletcher said. It make you change your outlook on life. Then he laughed. It sounded like hee hee, but then he stopped. Look like any people you know, Virginia asked him. Nobody I know, nobody I care to know, Fletcher said. Did he say where he's coming from? He said Chicago, Virginia said. Where? Fletcher asked. That's what he told me, she said. And nothing but that blue laundry bag? He calls himself Robert X, Virginia said. One of them, huh? Fletcher said. Well, you got something on your hand now. What you mean? Virginia asked him. You'll find out, Fletcher said and laughed again. Virginia hung up the telephone and went back into the kitchen. From the table, she could see the rain touching lightly against the window. She could see the soft swing of the limbs in the pecan tree beside the house. There was not a pecan on the tree, not a leaf. Not one bird sat on any of the limbs. The tree was bare and gray. The low-hanging sky above it was the same ashy gray color. The kitchen was warm, comfortable, but Virginia felt sad, cold, just by looking out of the window at the rain. Virginia thought about a tenant upstairs in number four. She wondered if he was hungry. She did not serve food at the house, but she had cooked much more than she could ever eat. If she ate soup every day for a week, there would still be some left over. It was her conscience bothering her again, she told herself. It was not satisfied that he had made her let him into the house, but now it is trying to make her feed him too. When she got through eating, she dished up another bowl of soup and put some crackers on a plate and took it up to his room. After knocking twice and he still had not answered her, she pushed the door open and went in. She would set the plate on the bucket of water and the food would still be warm when he woke up. She noticed that he had taken off his hat and coat and had hung them on the closet door. But halfway across the room, she suddenly felt strange, like she was being watched. And she jerked around to look back at the bed. He was wide awake, not watching her, but looking out of the window. Virginia had turned so suddenly that she had spilled some of the hot soup out of the bowl on the plate and some of it even on her hand. She's so angry now that she couldn't do anything for a while but stand there and look at him. She didn't know whether she ought to curse him out and leave the food there or curse him out and take the food back to the kitchen. I didn't know I was disturbing your honor, she said. I thought your honor could be hungry. Your honor looked like he'd been starving to death. Robert sat up slowly and reached into his pocket to get her some money to pay for the food. It's free, your honor, she said. I don't serve no food here. I just try to be a good Christian, that's all. She set the plate on the lamp table at the head of the bed and backed away. She was at the door when she heard him asking, you got any churches back here? Virginia was a short, plump, very black, very emotional woman, but nothing could change her attitude about a person quicker than hearing him mention the church or the name of God. She stopped at the door with her hand on the doorknob and looked back at Robert. He had picked up his plate and he had started eating. <clears throat> churches, she said. We got three if you say churches. You say churches? He nodded his head without looking back at her. He was eating and looking out at the rain against the window. You need to go to church? She asked him. No, he said. Just want to know where it's at, huh? He nodded again, but so slightly that if she had not been watching him closely, she never would have seen it. We have two Baptists and a Catholic, she said. But we don't have none for the Muslims. She stopped. Baptist, she heard him say. We got just one up. We got we got one just up the street there. She said, <clears throat> Solid Rock Baptist Church, my church. Reverend Philip J. Martin is the pastor. I suppose you don't heard of Reverend Martin up there in Chicago. She thought she heard him say no, no. She said, Well, he's been in all the papers, on TV. He's the civil rights leader around here. He's our Martin Luther King around here. Everybody proud of him, black and white. We're thinking about sending him to Washington. Would be the first one from around here, you know. Must be a good man, she heard him say. The people think so. Of course, there's some against him, white and black. You find that everywhere. But most of them, all for him. He'll be a good man in Washington. He should have done some wondrous thing here. And what's he done, 
she heard him say. What's he done? Virginia said, what's he done? She said again. Done everything, everything, and changed just about everything around here, except for Chanel up there. It won't be long for Chanel fall to. He'll fall like all the rest. He's an old white man uptown. He, he don't want to pay the color nothing for working. He owned the biggest store up there. Everybody go to his store, but still he won't pay nobody nothing. He'll change his mind when Philip get through with him. You mark my word. Philip Martin, huh? She heard him saying. He's the man round here, the man we count on. Virginia saw him nod his head, but he never did look back at her. That evening, just before dark, he came downstairs and left the house. Virginia stayed up watching television late that night, but she didn't hear him come back in. The next morning, around 6 o'clock, even before she got out of bed, Fletcher Zeno called on the telephone. Want to hear something good? He asked her. No, she said and hung up. He called back. What you want, Fletcher? She said. You know what time it is? Five minutes to six, according to my watch, Fletcher said. Virginia heard him drink something quickly. She figured he was at home and drinking hot coffee. I seen your boy sitting behind Reverend Martin's church door last night, he said. Midnight, on my way home. First, I thought I was seeing me a ghost there. But I said to myself, now, come on, man, you know you don't believe in no ghosts. Then I thought maybe it was a dog. But what dog in his right mind would lay behind that door in all that rain when he could go under that church and stay dry? Virginia heard him take a, a quick sip from the coffee again. I turned around by Brick Land grocery store and I came on back to get me another look at him. I got out the car this time. I thought it might be Dago Jack or Uncle Matty sick there and they can't get home. Halfway up the walk, I seen who it was, your boy there, slumped back against that door with his hand jobbed down in his pockets. Could have been sleeping for all I know. I turned around and went on back. Well, another sip from the hot coffee. What you think? You think he's crazy? Or you think he just liked that cold rain? I don't think he's crazy. I don't, like he, I don't think he liked cold rain neither, Virginia said. I think you're making all that up because you didn't get that 75 cents. All day long, Fletcher told the same story to other people, but like Virginia, no one wanted to believe him. Two days later, though, everyone did. Monday at Thelma's Cafe, Abe Matthews told the people how he had seen Robert standing under one of the big oak trees in the cemetery. Abe said he had seen him there Sunday evening just after dusk, so he was not ready to swear on a stack of Bible that it was Robert. But if it was not Robert, then it was a ghost wearing a long army overcoat that was much too big for him and an army cap pulled all the way down to his ears. Evelina Badley, on her way to work at the St. Adrian Laundry, saw him 6 o'clock in the morning on the bank of the St. Charles River. The rain had fallen steadily the past two weeks, and the river was high and rough, flowing swiftly southwardly toward New Orleans. And Robert stood on the bank among the hanging branches of the weeping willows, staring down at the water, oblivious to Evelina, to everything else around him except for the river. That same evening, Dago Jack, on his way home from Brick Olance's grocery store where he'd been sitting and talking all day, saw him standing across the street in front of Philip Martz's house. Dago mentioned it to the people at the store the next day, but since they had seen him practically everywhere else already, they thought nothing of it. He had two meals at, at Thelma's Cafe. On Saturday, the day after he arrived in St. Adrian, he came into the cafe around noon and sat down at a table in the corner. When Thelma told him what was on the menu for the day, he told her to bring him a plate of red beans and rice and mustard greens and a piece of cornbread. The next day, he came back about the same time and ordered giblets and rice and greens and cornbread. He sat at the same table as before, a little red and white checkered oilcloth covered table in the corner. Neither time did he take off his cap or his coat. Both times he paid for his meals with change money. The money quarters, nickels, dimes was black with corrosion. Monday started buying his food at Brick Olenza's grocery store. Abe Matthews and tall white Unc Matty Dago, Jack Fletcher Zeno, they all sat or stood around the heater talking. They had been talking about him just before he came in, but now they were quiet. They got quiet, one then the other glancing at him at the counter. He bought sausages, cheese, bread, a bottle of cheap muscatel wine. After he had paid for his groceries, he left the store without saying a word to anyone, went back home to eat. 
More that black money? Fletcher asked Brick. Brick Oland looked at the money he still held in his hand and nodded his head. Hmm, Dago Jack said. Mostly peculiar, Unc Maddie said. What's that, Unc Maddie? Tall White asked him. Peculiar, Unc Maddie said. Peculiar. Later that evening, they saw him walking again, but he never spoke to them. He never asked about anyone. He never visited anyone that they knew of. But day and night, and whether it was raining or not, or cold or not, they would meet him or pass him walking the street. Several people had seen him on St. Anne Street, not far from the house where the minister and the civil rights leader, Philip Martin, lived. Chapter 3. Elijah Green, a teacher at the elementary school in St. Adrian, lived with Philip Martin and his family. He gave piano lessons to Philip's 10-year-old daughter, Joyce Ann, as payment for his room and board. He was also choir director in Phillips' church and worked with him in the civil rights program. He gave regular parties at the house for the workers and their supporters, and the next one would be the following Saturday. Thursday evening, two days before the party, Elijah was driving up St. Anne Street when the lights from his car flashed on Robert walking up ahead of him. He recognized the army overcoat and the cap. He had seen Robert several times before, but he had been afraid to stop and speak to him. This time he would speak. As he came up closer, he leaned over to the door and rolled on the glass. Can I give you a lift somewhere? He asked. Elijah had heard that others had offered Robert a ride, but he had turned them all down. Elijah expected the same thing this time, too. But Robert stopped and looked at him. Then, after glancing back, over his shoulder, down the street, he got into the car. Elijah grinned nervously and held out his hand. He noticed how long and skeletal Robert's fingers were, just the opposite from his own hand, which is small and soft. How far are you going? He asked after they had driven off. I'm just walking, Robert said. Pretty bad weather, Elijah said. Robert stared out in front of the car without answering him. But suddenly, he turned to Elijah and asked if Elijah owned the brick house down the street. Elijah realized now that Robert had gotten in the car only because he had seen the car parked in, Philip, in front of Philip Martin's house. That's Reverend Martin's house, Elijah said. I just have a room there. Reverend Martin, Robert asked, as if he had never heard the name before. That's his church not far from where you're staying, Elijah told him. Some kind of civil rights leader, Robert asked. These civil rights leader around here, Elijah said. We're having a little rally at the house day after tomorrow. If you're still around, why don't you drop by? What kind of rally, Robert asked. That singing and praying stuff? Elijah grinned to himself. No, nothing like that, at least not this time, he said. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be just talking. We have a store uptown that don't want to pay the blacks nothing for working, and we have to see what we can do about it. He looked at Robert. Drop by. I'll introduce you to Reverend Martin. He's a pretty big man around here. Robert made a grunting sound in his chest. It was too dark in the car for Elijah to see the expression on his face, but he had the feeling that Robert didn't care too much for the minister. I heard you were from Chicago, Elijah said, visiting some people here in St. Adrian. I'm here for a conference, Robert told him. In St. Adrian, Elijah asked. I'm meeting somebody here, Robert said, looking out in front of the car, not at, Eli not at Elijah. What kind of conference, Elijah asked. A black man's conference, Robert said. Where's it going to be hell? He'll let me know, Robert said. The man you're meeting? Yeah. When you all supposed to meet? I don't know. He said, then he turned to Elijah, maybe this weekend, huh? He stared at Elijah and grinned out of the side of his mouth. Now, Elijah felt a little afraid of him. How come you chose St. Adrian, he asked after a while. He chose it, Robert said. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Elijah turned off St. Anne Street onto Choctaw Drive, which is so narrow that when meeting another car, he had to pull close to the ditch and stop so that the other car could go by him. He told Robert that he was having drinks with some of other teachers at the bar and asked if you'd like to join them. Robert shook his head. Can I drop you off anywhere, Elijah asked him. No, I'll walk. I can easily drop you off at Virginia's if you want me to, Elijah told him. 
I'll walk, Robert said. When Elijah stopped in front of the Congo room where the other teachers were, Robert got out of the car and he stuck his head back into the window, inside the window. What time Saturday, he asked. Round five is good, Elijah said. If I'm still here, Robert said, staring at Elijah and nodding his head. Elijah, looking at him, felt something very sinister about, about him, yet he felt a deep pity for Robert. Robert seemed so frightened, he seemed so lost. Elijah watched him turn away now and watched him until, he had, until his coat had disappeared into the darkness. That was the last anyone saw of him for two days. Now he stayed in his room pacing the floor. Friday night, Abe Matthews, who had the room on the right side of him at Virginia's, heard him screaming, a long, deep-chested, muffled, animal-like howl, then whimpering and whimpering, whimpering like an animal caught in a trap. Abe beat on the wall and called to him, but he did not get an answer. He went out into the hall and knocked on the door, but still no answer, nothing. Not even the whimpering now. Abe went back into his room and lay down on the bed, listening, but there was nothing, nothing but the silence. I'm going to skip about uh, two, three chapters, I think, maybe two chapters, about 15 pages. Now, what has happened here is um, this is the day of the party, and Elijah has got, uh, asked a friend of his, another teacher, to bring Robert to the party because he's very busy. Uh, Robert has been at the party now for quite a while. And Philip Martin has given a talk to the people. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the room is very crowded. A, a large living room is very crowded. And Philip has talked to the people. There are two white couples there. Uh, one's a lawyer and his wife. The other is a dentist and his wife. The dentist is a member of the Board of uh, Education. And the lawyer is the civil rights law attorney. These, these couples are both white. I mean, the, the dentist and his wife and the lawyer and the wife are white. Chapter 7. Howard Mills left the party soon after Phillips's talk. About a dozen other people left at the same time. Still, the big living room remained crowded. Half of the people were gathered around Philip on one side of the room, the rest were in a smaller group throughout the house. <coughs> Robert stood in a corner alone. He had been watching Philip ever since Shepard pointed him out. Even when the people got between them, he would still look in that direction. Yet he did it so discreetly that no one, not even Shepard, who stood only a couple of feet away from him, was suspicious of anything. Shepard's girlfriend, Beverly, Beverly Ricard, had come to the party a few minutes earlier, and the two of them stood beside Robert talking. They had tried to get him into that conversation, but he remained quiet, alone, watching Philip all the time. For the past few minutes, Joyce and Phillips's ten-year-old daughter had been playing the piano, but there was so much noise in the room that no one paid any attention to her until the wife of the attorney moved away from the crowd around Philip to the girl. Others in the room soon joined her at the piano to listen. Elijah, who was Joyce Ann's teacher, stood behind the crowd with his tray of cups. Elijah's going through the crowd serving uh, eggnog and little sandwiches and that sort of thing. Each time she played a difficult piece, he would shut his eyes and shake his head from side to side as if he were in a swoon. But when she came to a part that might give us some trouble, he would catch his breath and wait and wait. Then when it was over, when she had done it in good form, he would sigh deeply, loud enough for others to hear, nod his head, and continue on through the crowd with his tray. But not everyone in the room or near the piano was listening to the music. Philip Martin was not, neither to the music or to the people talking to him now. For the past few minutes, he had been looking across the room at Shepard, Beverly, Robert, Shepard, who had noticed it, did not think Philip was looking at them particularly. He thought Philip was tired of all the people around him and wanted to get away. But Philip continued looking at them, no watching them now. Even when someone would touch him on the arm or the shoulder, he would give him 
his attention only a moment, then he would look back across the room again. Joyce Ann was finishing her third song at the piano, and the people were applauding her again. But Philip seemed oblivious to everything around him. Shepard saw him push his way out of the crowd, farther into the room. There he hesitated a moment, as if he was trying to remember something out of, in the back of his mind. Then he started in that direction again, but after going only a step or two, he staggered. <clears throat> he staggered twice, then fell to the floor. Octave Bajeron, <clears throat> who had been standing next to Philip, rushed to him now and told everyone else to stay back. But the people did not move back. They pressed him closer. One of the women Philip had spoken to during his short speech, Liza Claiborne, screamed and swore that he had been poisoned. Soon others were repeating it. Robert, who had been standing clear across the room, pushed his way through the crowd till he was directly over Philip. But he stood over him only a moment, as if he wanted to make sure that he was down. Then he turned and pushed his way out of the room. He was the only one who left, but the room was still in such confusion that no one paid him the least attention. Alma, this is Phillips' uh, wife. <clears throat> Alma, who had rushed to Phillips when he fell, now knelt beside him, holding his head up off the floor in her lap. Philip had lost conscious only a moment as a fighter might who has been hit hard on the jaw, but soon he began recognizing people around him and he tried quickly, desperately to push himself up. Octave Bajeron put his hand on his chest and told him to lay still a moment. I'm all right, Philip said to Octave. I'm all right, he said to Alma. He looked up at all the people standing over him. I'm all right, I'm all right, he said to them. No, Octave Bajeron said, pressing his hand on his chest. Be quiet. Listen to me. Can you hear me, Philip? Be quiet. Lay still a moment. I'm all right, Philip Martin said. The people who stood over him, canopy-like, could see tears in his eyes. I'm all right. Please let me up. I have to get up. Don't let me deny him twice. No one knew what he was talking about. No one asked him what he was talking about. You don't feel well, Philip. Octave Bajeron said, listen to me, you don't feel well. Alma, Philip said, Alma, please, he begged her. Octave Bajeron nodded to Anthony to give him a hand. <clears throat> Jonathan, this is Philip's young uh, assistant uh, pastor at the church. Then he wrote out a prescription for two bottles of pills. Elijah followed the drug as Octave Bajeron uptown to bring the medicine back to the house. Now that everyone else had gone, the house was deadly quiet. The doctor, repeating exactly what the druggist had said earlier, told Alma that what Philip needed most was rest, quiet, and rest. Alma, Elijah, and Joyce Ann sat in the living room talking so softly among themselves that they could hardly hear each other. Now, um... <clears throat> But I, we skip some more until the next morning. <clears throat> During the night, while people have been calling and on the telephone find it, to find out about Philip's health, and uh, Elijah has been answering the telephone and telling them that he's all right, he's all right, he just needs rest, and he'd wish they wouldn't call. Um, when everyone goes to bed, Philip gets up, and he goes into his office. His office is a room across the hall from his bedroom. Um, first Alma go in and get him out, then later Elijah goes in and bring him out. The, uh, now, the following day, which would be the Sunday, he, um, Alma tells him that he can't go to church because he's tired and she's going to stay home to make sure that he does not go into the office anymore. When Elijah, Elijah and Joyce Ann go to church, when they come back, Joyce and Alma leave the house. And uh, Alma tells Elijah to stay there and make sure that Philip, uh, be sure Philip does not uh, do any work around the place because he, uh, he's already tired. Philip stayed in bed until he heard the car backing out of the yard. Then he got up, put on his robe. Elijah was at the piano now playing quietly, only with one hand. Philip stood by the door listening a moment 
Then when he was sure Elijah had not heard him moving round in the room, he hurried across the hall to his office. His office was a small, dark, cold room with heavy brown curtains over the windows. A desk, two chairs, a file cabinet with the furniture in the office. On the wall facing the desk was a large picture of the crucifixion. On the left wall were pictures of John, Robert, John and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King all in one frame. In another frame, hanging evenly with the first, were pictures of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and Booker T. Washington. Across the room on the right wall were Phillips' uh, diploma from Bible school, a 1970 calendar from the local mortuary, and a picture of Philip and his deacon standing before the church. The men were all dressed in dark suits, their hats in their hands, looking severely into the camera. Howard Mills, whose head was snow white, stood a couple inches taller than anyone else. The room was dark and cold, but Philip would not turn on the light or light the heater. He went directly to the window and pulled back the curtains to look out on the street. Where was the boy? Where was he this moment? Why wasn't he passing the house? Philip had heard that he walked the street day and night, raining or not, cold or not. Then where was he now? Philip stood at the window looking and waiting, but the boy did not go by the house. No one passed by walking or driving. There was nothing out there but a leafless pecan tree in the open pasture across the street. Philip did not move from the window. He was thinking about the dream that he had had the night before the boy got here. <clears throat> in the dream, he was sitting on the side of the bed just as he had done 20, 21 years ago. In the dream, just as, it, just as it had happened on that day, he saw the boy's small hand in the crack of the door as he took the money from the woman. The boy left with the money, but soon he brought it back. Can you have some water, please? Sure. <clears throat> when he left the second time, Philip got up, and ran after him. In the dream, it happened like this, but 21 years ago, he did not run after the boy. He had sat on the bed looking down at the floor until he was sure the boy had gone. Then he went to the woman who was still clutching the money, tore it out of her hand, and threw it into the fire. When the woman tried to get the money out of the fire with her bare hands, he, he slapped her heart so hard that she fell back across the floor. She came back, not for the money this time. The money had burned. She came back to fight. This time he hit her with his fist. Then he went back to the bed and sat down, burying his face in his hands. But in the dream, he told her the money did not, did not matter to him. He could have, she could have the money. He ran out of the house to catch up with the boy. The boy had already gotten on the wagon along with his mother and his other brother and sister and Chippo Simon was driving them to the road to catch the bus. Philip could see Joanna calling to him. He could see the oldest boy reaching out his small arms. But the other two children, <clears throat> sitting in the bed of the wagon, neither saw anything or heard anything. <clears throat> Philip woke up from the dream screaming, his clothes soaking wet with perspiration. He did not go back to sleep at all that night, and the next day, while sitting behind his desk in his office, several times he quit reading or writing to reflect on the dream. He could still see Joanna in the black overcoat and hat waving her arms and calling to him. But why black? Why black? He had never known her. He had never known her to wear anything but the brightest colors when she was here. Why black now? He could still see the oldest boy at the tailgate of the wagon, reaching out his small arms, but the other two children went on playing as if nothing was happening around them. He ran as hard as he could to catch up with them, but the wagon slowly, steadily moved farther and farther away from him. Philip stood at the window now, looking out on the street, looking and waiting, but the boy did not go by. No one went by. The street, gray, 
empty coal, the tree in the pasture across the street, gray, leafless, cold. Philip turned from the window to his desk. He wanted to pray. He needed to pray. But how could he pray? If he prayed out loud, he lodged would surely hear him. And he could not get satisfaction praying in silence. The Bible on his desk was open to the 14th chapter of John. He had chosen today's sermon from that chapter. He began reading, moving his lips as he read, Let not your heart be troubled. Yea, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, he stopped. He turned back to the window and pulled the curtains to the side. Who could he go to? Philip Martin wasn't accustomed to going for, to people for personal help. Philip Martin went to the people to help them. So who could he turn to? Who would believe him? Nobody. They believed what they wanted to believe, and they wanted to believe what those white men had said. Even Alma, even Elijah, who lived in the same house with him, who saw him every day, every night, took what they said without questioning. Tired, tired. He, Philip Martin, tired. He could have picked up both Octave Bajeron and Anthony McVeigh at the same time. He could have pushed that piano across the room with both of them sitting on top of it. Tired, tired. He, Philip Martin, tired. Why did he do it? Why did he lie there and let them say this? Did they ask him if he was tired? Did they, did they ask his wife anything? Why did he let them do this to himself, do this to his people? Why didn't he knock that hand away from his chest? He could have done it easily as flicking away a fly. Wouldn't that have been the right thing for him to do, brushing away that white man's hand and getting up? Being leader, wasn't that the thing to do? If not the leader, who then? Who? But no, like some cowardly, frightened little nigger, he lay there and let them do all the talking for him. He even let them push pills down in his mouth. Here's a white pill. Here's a pink pill. Take that and stay quiet. Rest, rest. Rest a few days and you'll be back doing your work again. Work? What work? Getting up off that floor without help, that was the work he should have done. His back was to the window now, and he was looking at the pictures on the wall. These great men always gave him encouragement when he was troubled. In his heart, he asked them for guidance. He prayed quietly to the picture of Christ on the cross. He turned to the window now and looked out on the street again, but no one was passing by his house. He could hear Elijah at the piano. Should he go to Elijah? But say what to Elijah? Say what to Elijah today that he could not say yesterday or last night when Elijah called him out of the office? Say what to Elijah that he could not even say to his wife? No, he must first talk to the boy. He had to find out why he was here. Did his mother send him here? He was too young when he left here to remember him. Did she send him here? And what for? For revenge? If so, why this game? A dozen people had seen him passing by the house day and night. Several people had seen him standing out there before the door. Now he had even come inside, but still nothing, not a word. Why? Why this game? Philip went out of the office and stood in the door between the hall and the living room. Elijah had just finished a song and was turning a page on the hymnal to begin another when Philip spoke to him. You always practicing, huh, Elijah? Elijah jerked around to see Philip standing only a few feet away. I was listening to the music from the bedroom, Philip said. I thought I would come in here to listen better. Alma wants you to stay in bed, sir, Elijah told him. She went on the island to get the children. She told me to make sure you stayed in bed. I'm all right, Philip said. He went to the door and pulled the curtains to the side. He looked through the glass, through the screen porch. But no one stood in the street looking at his house, and no one was passing by. Something the matter? Elijah asked him. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. Difficult cup, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the best I could do. It's great. Something the matter? Elijah asked him. I'm just checking the weather, Philip said. It's sure to freeze the night, Elijah told him. How is church? Philip asked, turning from the door and looking back at Elijah. All right, Elijah said. Elsie got the heaters lighted on time, Philip asked. It was still a little chilly when I got there, Elijah said. Most of the people kept their coats on. 
Mills showed up, Philip asked. He was there, Elijah said. How did Jonathan make out, Philip asked. All right, Elijah said. But Jonathan is still a little too, Elijah touched the side of his head, too sophisticated for the people, especially the old people. They feel Jonathan is talking over them, not to them. Jonathan is that new breed, Philip said. He thinks education, big words, is all you need to communicate. He'll have to learn, but he'll learn. You have to break them big words down to reach people, especially his people here. What did he talk about? The work mostly, Elijah said. Chanel up there mostly. Did the people ask about me? Everybody did, Elijah said. What did you tell them? I told them you fell because you were tired, Elijah said. Do I look tired to you, Elijah? Philip asked him. Sir, Elijah said. Philip stood wide-legged and stretched out his two big arms. In his navy blue cotton robe, he looked like a, a heavyweight fighter in the center of the ring. Do I look tired to you? He asked again. That's what the doctor said, Elijah said. Yes, that's what the doctor said, Philip said. But Octave Bajron said it first. Mr. Bajron studied medicine, Elijah said. I think he... Octave Bajron studied pills, Philip said. Pills, not medicine. White pills and pink pills. And there's a difference, Elijah. Elijah thought Philip was speaking a little strangely and he felt embarrassed and lowered his head. That's the first time I fell in my life, Philip told him. I've been cut, I've been shot at, no, even shot. Staggered, but I never went down. Not too many men can brag about that. Elijah nodded his head and even smiled. He was proud that his minister had never fallen before. I had fights after fights when I was a young man, your age. Not one man ever knocked me down, not this boy. He laughed, then he balled his fist. He looked like a heavyweight fighter with his big fist hanging out the sleeves of the robe. But I knocked down a few in my time, Philip went on. This here, this was a powerful weapon, boy, in my time. He slammed his big fist into the palm of the other hand. You heard about me when I was about your age? Elijah nodded his head. He had heard about Philip when Philip was about his age. He had heard about his fights. He had heard about all the women, his gambling. He had heard about his prowess as a baseball player. I was a man, boy, Philip said. I was a man then. But then suddenly Elijah saw him frowning and squeezing his forehead. Something the matter? Elijah asked him. I was just thinking about being a man, Philip said. Just thinking about being a man. Men supposed to clam up off that floor. Not if you're tired, sir, Elijah told him. Floyd Patterson was tied, Philip said. Did you see that fight? How many times that Swede knocked him down? Six times, seven times, but he got up. He kept on getting up. I fell once and I let a little finger. I could have knocked that hand away like, like knock and let off my robe. He flicked at an imaginary lint on the sleeve of his robe. Why didn't I, Elijah? And don't say I was tired. Yes, sir, Elijah said. Then why didn't I? I don't know, sir. Because he's white? And that's why y'all believe without questioning, because he's white? At that time, what else could we believe, sir? Elijah asked. Nothing else, Philip said. I don't know why I'm blaming y'all. I'm the one to blame. For what, sir? Elijah asked. For falling? For denying him twice, Philip said. Denying who, sir? Elijah asked. Philip shook his head. He could not say any more to Elijah now than he could say last night. It was a good party, he said. I, I thought so, Elijah agreed. He had a lot of people, Philip said. I didn't expect to see so many in this kind of weather. They came for a good cause, Reverend Martin. You think so, Elijah? I think so, Elijah said. Lately, I've been having my doubts, Philip said. Since Martin's death, I don't know. The older people are still there, but where are the young ones, Elijah? If you're not reaching the young, what good are you doing? You've done a lot of good, Reverend Martin, Elijah said. I have done, Elijah. You're still doing, sir. Leaders have to climb up off that floor, Elijah, Philip said. We can't let others speak for us no more. You speak for us, Reverend Martin, Elijah said, trying to encourage him. I didn't speak for you yesterday, Philip said. I reckon it's no sin to fall, but surely it's one not to get up. He turned from Elijah and looked out on the street again. Where was the boy? In his room, walking the street? Where? It looked so cold and gray outside. Was he warm? Was he hungry? Where was he? Did many of the school teachers come to the party? He asked Elijah. He was not looking at Elijah. He was still looking out on the street, looking for the boy. 
Shepherd here, Elijah said, him and Beverly, none of the others. I suppose they had something else to do. <clears throat> Did that other young man show up, Philip asked, with his back to Elijah still, the one whose shepherd was supposed to bring with him? He was here, Elijah said, him, Shep, Beverly, they stood across the room over there all the time. Philip turned back to Elijah, pretending he did not know what Elijah was talking about. He stood where? He asked. Elijah nodded his head toward the other side of the room. Over there, he said. Wait, Philip said, wait. Oh, yes, yes. I do remember seeing. Did, did he have on an army coat, an army cap? That was Robert, Elijah said. Robert, Philip asked. Robert X, he calls himself, Elijah said. Is he a Muslim? I don't know, Elijah said, but he sure don't carry himself like one. Why would he call himself Robert X? Is, is, he, is he hiding from something? He said he was here for a conference, Elijah said, a black man's conference. There's always some kind of conference going on these days. The conference is here in St. Adrian, Philip asked. No, sir, somewhere else. He's just meeting somebody here, according to him. Don't that look a little strange to you, Philip asked going to a conference, the way he dressed, the way he carried himself? What could he discuss with anybody at a conference? I don't have any idea, Reverend Martin, Elijah said. He just told me a conference, nothing else. i tell you one thing, though. He sure is a sad person. How do you mean, Philip asked. He just looked lost, Elijah said. Lost as anybody ever seen in my life. I gave him a ride the other night, and he just looked lost. I'm glad he came to the party, but I don't think he enjoyed himself. Maybe you ought to invite him back, Philip said. Yes, invite him and Shepard and Beverly and, and the others back again. Maybe you'll feel different around a few of people, a few group of people. If I see him again, I'll tell him, Elijah said. Tell Shepard and Beverly too, Philip said. I'll probably see them at the Congo room later, Elijah told him. Philip went back into his office. He heard Elijah telling him that he ought to be in bed, but he did not answer. He went into the room and stood by the window looking out on the street. What is his name? Philip asked himself. What is his name? Robert is not. I'm sure of that. What is my boy's name? If I, could, if I could just remember his name, then I might have something to start with. Thank you. I just got over a flu so that reading couldn't been a little better if I was a little stronger and flat out of a chair to sit in. <laughs> Couldn't stand. That wasn't our reading, about 45 minutes reading. That's fine. That's fine. I might